Hey, Tammy. How you doing? <laughs> okay, what we're going to be doing is we are going to be doing the... Let me get the light on my face here. Let's still read. Okay, we're good. Uh, we're going to be doing the first book or one... The, the first chapter I'm going to do, I'm going to do here in the... Come on, give me... Okay, it's not being it's not being cooperative tonight, but this is the book one of the Foxfire book series. And what I decided to do is there's a couple chapters before this that kind of cover people. I'm going to kind of go into the um how can I put this? Go into the um knowledge part of it um so what we're going to do is if, if you have these hey emma if you have these books what i'm going to do is i am starting on page 31 wood and with wood it's like using the proper tool with with wood is choosing the proper wood to do a certain job and many woods will do the same job, but some will do it a little bit better than others, so to speak. And one thing that the book slightly touched on <clears throat> um, I'm having a hard time talking today. Sorry, it's, it's been one of those days. Um, the trees around you are a four season resource especially when it comes to medicinals uh the book barely just said um um ingredients for medicinal recipes that's about it but each tree many trees have medicinal properties as well so it's something that you might want to dig into it's not covered in the book so far, but something you might want to look into down the line. But uh, these trees did um, a lot. The, uh, the, the trees in the wood did a lot for these for the people of Appalachia. Um, it helped them with their fires for cooking and for warmth. Um, kept them covered. Uh, well, them and their animals covered. Um, like I said, recipes for some, some medicinals, some furniture. Many things were made out of wood. Wagons, plow frames, all kinds of stuff. Okay. So I was like, what is, that's what that is. Let me get this back over where it should be. There we go. There it is. Um, you know, I quickly kind of Burn through this real quick. They talked about many different ways to cure wood. Um, and I'm going to read an excerpt from this about that. There are several ways to cure wood. The chosen me method depended on the size of the pieces and how quickly they were needed. Very small pieces which would fit into a pot were boiled. Sometimes we boiled them all day and overnight, and they, they was cured good says Harry Brown. The water would dry the sap out, and when the water itself evaporated, the wood, the wood would be ready to use. People also dried smaller pieces by the fire overnight, being careful that they didn't get too hot and warp or burn. They often use this method to season tool handles, drying only the, only the end that fit into the head of the tool. Hey, Hoga. Oh, I hear, I hear you there, Tammy, because I want to make a uh, pine sap. Hey, Tibor. Um, the pine, I got more, more than enough beeswax and, so, and uh, some of the other stuff to make it because I make my own fix of wax, too. But um, I like to make some pine sap as well, and I keep on forgetting to go out and look for um, red pine sap. Is it red, actually, no, I'm sorry, white pine sap. 
Another way to cure lumber is to use a dry kiln. A large rack would, would be built three to four feet off the ground and covered cover with a roof and sometimes walls to keep out the rain. The lumber will be stacked crosswise on the rack for maximum air circulation. And under the lumber, several small fires would be built. A similar way, according to Harry Brown, was to make, make a little rack and stack your lumber up around it and just make a teepee. So, two different ways. One is to actually kind of build like a little building, make a rack about three or four feet off the ground, and put your fires underneath it on the ground. And there were small fires, just enough to make some heat. You didn't want, but you had to watch them constantly. You didn't want them to go out, and you didn't want them to get any larger. Um, the larger fires would possibly warp your boards and burn your burn your lumber and if you let the fire go out it never gets seasoned at all and what i mean by seasoned is dry dry that you drive all the, all the moisture out of it and you do it in such a way that it doesn't check or crack on it that in the simplest method that they did they, they literally would take all take the lumber that they wanted to season if they didn't have a kiln or a way to, to heat it up, they stack it one way, turn around, and stack it the other way, and just make a whole stack like that of all the wood that, that they wanted to that they wanted to keep until they're ready to use it. Okay, and getting into some of these woods, chestnut. Now, it was very plentiful in Appalachia until a blight came through and literally wiped it all out and in that area. We had some chestnut up here. I'm not saying a lot, but we do have some chestnuts up here. And um, it grew straight, sometimes four to five feet in diameter. And I mean, four to five feet in diameter, you make a lot off of that. I mean, it's big. <laughs> it was fairly soft and light, easy to split and work. It lasted forever. Um, green ch chestnut was split into fence rails, floor, uh, punch on floors. Wide planking for doors and inside wall boards, lathing to co cover the cracks between wall logs. Larger trees were used for the wa for wall logs themselves, sleepers and sills and plates. Slender poles made good rafters and joists. It was a good building material. I mean, and if you had it on your property, then you had. A good bit of material to work with, especially if they're very mature older trees. And that was all unseasoned. They're still using it green. Uh, seasoned, they use it for caskets, furniture, animal calls, dough boards, and kitchen utensils, and sometimes for double oxen yokes. So it was a light but durable material. Then we move into hickory. Um, if you ever bought a wooden handled hammer, a uh, hatchet, sorry about that, or anything else of that nature, if you look on the handle, the handle will nine times out of ten will say hickory, genuine hickory handle. Whether it is or not, depending on where you get it, that is yet to be determined, but most of your good wooden handle tools. That's a hickory handle on there. Okay, hickory is a hardwood with a slight with a slightly wavy grain that's quite difficult to work. Even so, it was desirable as is that is heavy, very flexible, and very durable. That is why. Oh, same here. I've got hickory all over the place. In fact, one of the trees in our back, we have a hickory tree in our backyard. Um, how to use the nuts, so as my great 
my grandfather would say, because he used to try getting nuts off that tree every now and again. They're bitter, bitter than gall. Never did quite find it. They were bitter, yeah, but where the in gall came from, don't know. <laughs> That's a good possibility, Emma. There, there are some trees that will do that. And I kind of look at it as kind of almost like a form of coping, which probably not today, but we'll get into that because there's another book I want to go over. So as I said with, with these books, it's going to be like once every other week, like every other week or every three weeks, I'm going to be doing something from this. There's a couple other things I want to go over as well. So. And coping is going to be part of that other book. Okay, green hickory, from what they say, makes the best fires. I've never used green wood to start a fire, but I'm pretty sure that once you get it up to a certain temperature, it starts to dry out. It's going to burn, like I said here, for a very long time. And it's going to burn hot. Okay, and the ashes that were left over, they used, they used to use those ashes to make the lye for homemade soap. Maybe. That's a good possibility. Yes, it does, and we're getting we're we're getting to that. Um, the leftover over at okay for how many saplings were used in stick and mud chimneys. Larger larger logs were worked into wagon floors and rough furniture. The wise served as rope, like the really thin branches served as a rope for hanging meats in the smokehouse and also they, they would hang them between the rafters to hang fruit hang fruit to dry on them. Uh, da, 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 da. Sometimes the bark was split off green and used for bottoming chairs and it was it was often chewed like bubble gum. Never tried it. I have a hectic tree in the backyard. Might might do that. Maybe. Maybe. Don't count on it, but maybe. <laughs> Hickory had to be seasoned for tool handles and wagon pillars, uh, tongues, axles, spokes, and wheel hubs. It's the best material for wagon parts as it's flexible, makes a great. Okay, it didn't say anything about smoking, but yes, I have had hickory smoked meat. Oh my God, is that stuff good. Um, and if you know where to find it, you could, um, it's called chunk charcoal. It does it's not like a brick cat, it's kind of like these like flat broken up sheets. Um a friend of mine found that in hickory, straight up hickory charcoal, and that was some of the best steak I've ever had. Okay, oak. Oak is a very hard wood that has many of the same uses as hickory, but it's far more easily worked, which is kind of ironic. Oak is a lot harder than hickory, but since most oak grain is straighter, it makes it a little bit easier to work. Unseasoned oak of any variety makes hot, long-lasting fires and good coals that don't pop at so much as hickory. Unseasoned white oak was made in, in the splits for splits for baskets and chair bottoms. And, and water spanish and red oak were all favorites for boards to cover roofs. Oak, oak was also used green for simple for, for simple furniture, wagon beds, and split rails for fences. See we had some hazelnut on here because I remember I had to do a leaf project for school. And I know I had hazelnut, I had um, chestnut, 
Yeah, and I remember my my one grandmother talk about the same thing. Uh, sweet gum, sweet gum sap like chewing gum. Okay, white oak saplings were used for making malls as shown. Let me see if I can find plate 11 here. Oh, I was wondering if we were allowed. Okay, if you could see that, two, two illustrations above that, that's what they used to make malls out of. It was basically like a wooden hammer or a wooden tool that they used to strike objects with. Okay, that's my Discord going off there, if you heard that. Okay. Uncut saplings often serve as as springs to power hand lays and to spring and to spring the triggers on animal traps. What they mean by uncut it is it's still rooted, it's still alive, and they would bend it over um, for like a hand what they call it, a hand lathe or a foot lathe or what most people call it, a spring pole lathe. The oak sapling acted as a spring. Instead of the lathe going one direction, it would go so far, then go back. But they tried to get about three or four revolutions going both ways. I've watched, I've watched some people use a spring pole lathe. It's rather interesting to do. And some people still will use a a version of the spring pole lathe, but they'll use it inside of a building and they'll actually have a spring, an actual spring hanging off the roof with the drive rope hanging off of that to a foot pedal that gets wrapped around the uh, the piece that they're working. It's an interact it's a very interesting looking operation, but it's it's the same same principle. The spring lets you go so far out and when you let your foot off the pedal, it spins the wood the other direction. It works the same way. Oh, that's cool, Emma. There's a, a place up in the mountains that, um, for demonstration purposes now, that they, they still make charcoal. And what they used the charcoal for was to fire the brick kilns. That place is, there's brick, if you know where to look, you can find brick kilns all over the place, up up in the mount, up around my uncle's camp. And that's what they used in the brick kilns to fire the brick, was the charcoal. Exactly, Tibor. Okay, oak was seasoned for wheel spokes, hubs, and felons. And felons were the wheel rims. Split, it was used for flooring, furniture, spinning wheels, and plow frames. White oak made the, be made the best barrels, tubs, and buckets according to every one of, every one of our contacts. For storing whiskey, the inside of the barrels were charred to help age and improve the whiskey's flavor. So, if you find an original oak whiskey cask, or if somebody said, if you can see inside of it, see if the inside of it's charred. If it's not charred, there you go. Okay, locust. And we have, just to give you an idea of locust here. There's still locust trees standing out in our woods that my dad was set was telling me that they were dead when he was a kid. He's 80 years old. I'm 50 years old. They're still standing. <laughs> um, and there's if you look at some of my videos, and I can't remember which ones I did it in, but I showed a, like two or three different locust fence posts.
that are still standing in the woods that were sunk there 130 years ago that are still standing. So before you begin to look, keep, the, keep that in mind. Locust is one of the hardest woods, difficult to, to work, but useful ne nevertheless. It doesn't draw up a great, it doesn't draw up a great deal, resists terminites, and it rarely rots when placed in water or on the ground. Sap locust is the name given to the younger trees, which grow fairly quickly to eight or ten inches in diameter. The adult lo locust grows more slowly and is much lar larger than the saplings. Called yellow locust, it is preferred over the younger trees, but it's getting scarce now. Come here, I got a ton of it for you. <laughs> right, here we go. Green locust was often handy for foundation blocks. It also made fine floor, floor sleepers, fence posts, stakes, railroad ties, and floating bridges. Season it was made into pegs, dowels, and wooden pillars and axles. Oh, yeah. In fact, in our pasture fence, I think my dad cut a couple of them dead locust trees down, and we used those uh, on our pasture. We have tea, tea posts every so often. We have tea posts, but every so often we, we, would, we would sink one of them locust posts in. Yeah, it's the same thing here in southern Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, in fact, the one the one part of our property right behind our barn, on the one trail, you don't go ten feet and you pass twelve of them, just standing right there. Now, if you go off in the woods either direction, you'll find them all over the place. But um, yeah, I've cut it with a handsaw, not an easy task. I watched my dad cut it with a chainsaw. You know, it looked like he was cutting concrete. There's sparks flying out of it. So it is that hard, but it is that durable and will last for that long. So with locusts, something to keep in mind. Okay, one that Emma brought up was poplar. Poplar is light and grows very straight and fast with the limbs beginning far above the ground. It is termed white or yellow depending on the age and color. The younger white poplar is fairly hard, and the older yellow poplar is soft and easily worked. Yellow poplar is aged, ripened trees that, that stood there for centuries and turned yellow. White poplar is the same kind of tree, but it don't get old enough in this day and time. Green poplar was very good for cabin logs, rafters, joists, and weatherboard. Season that was used for furniture, paneling, caskets, dough boards, and dugout dough trays. It was also a favorite for ox yokes being light, strong, and easily worked. Yes, that is one of the main problems with locust. Huge problem. It, it, it's, if, if you find a tree that's old and I'm going to be honest with you guys right now. Our, probably the biggest locust we have standing back here is like this. Maybe about that big around. And it's been back here for the better part of a century. That we know of. Probably longer. Still standing. A couple of the trees that are back there though. If you look at the bark. It seems like the older it gets the more it twists. After it dies. It will just contract and keep twisting. I mean it looks like a barber's pole. It's like literally, and you can see bulging at this twist. Kind of, kind of funky looking. <laughs> okay, pine. Pine is another one of those woods that's everywhere. Not the greatest. It's kind of like a, a do all, if you will. Pine's one of the softer woods. It grows straight and is both durable and easily worked with hand tools. Unseasoned, the large trees were used for cabin logs and occasionally even cut for foundation blocks. They were split to make paneling and flooring, 
and the slender poles were sometimes used for rafters and, and, and joists. Season pine is still easily worked, so it was used for, for doors and windows and door frames that required careful fitting. It also made good furniture. The resin was widely used in homemade salves and remedies. There you go. Pieces of fat pine were perfect for starting fires. You ever hear the, hear the term fat wood? This is where it came from. And pine knots were prized for torches in night hunts. They would find like a big knot because that sap has like has like a turpentine in it. Highly flammable. And once you got that lit, that would stay lit for a while. There's, there's big knots. It adds to strength, but the thing you have to remember is as a twist, it's taking that grain with it too. So it's going to be, the more twist, the harder it is to work. But it adds strength to the piece. So Yeah, pine rosin or pine sap. Um, as I said, if you can find pine in the woods, you can make a fire. Simple as that. If you can get fat wood from that pine tree, you can make a fire. Um, you can take, you can find fat wood on a live pine tree, cut it down to shavings, hit it with a ferro rod, and you'll get flame. Simple as that. Walnut. Walnut is a hardwood that splits, that splits fairly easy and, and works well. We got the impression that it was used for as much for its aesthetic qualities as its practicality. Unseasoned, it was sometimes used split for fence rails and panelings. Seasoned, it had more uses, fine furniture primarily. And the reason I'm, I'm reading these is they're short little excerpts. So instead of me just trying to kind of gloss over it, we can kind of dig into this a little bit. Maple is a hardwood with light color and wavy grain. The grain makes it good for carving, and when seasoned, it turns it turns so well on a hand lathe that it, it was popular for furniture. It was also used is also used seasoned for spoons. Yes, they. You have to remember, these people carved their own spoons. Butter molds, gun stocks, drawer knobs, auger handles, and box planes. It can be worked and sanded very thin with, without splitting. It was also perfect for making fiddles and guitars. So, Yep. I know somebody has a barn full of locust fence posts that they cut themselves. I'm like, you, I'm like, I'm sitting there looking at them and just like, and this barn's in good shape. He's like, dude, this barn's going to fall down and this locust posts are still going to be just fine. <laughs> Okay, we're going to kind of move along here. Yeah, we have we have some maple furniture here. I'm trying to think. What we, I think we had maple furniture. I think we gave away the one piece that actually had maple in it. Uh, but we have a lot of antique furniture here as well. Uh, some of it was made by my ancestors. Okay, cherry. Wild red cherry is fairly hard, but has a deep, rich color and is and a slightly wavy grain. Seasoned, it was it was used primarily for furniture. The bark was a pop, popular ingredient for cough medication. So there's a little bit of your medicinal tie-in that I was talking about. Um, as I said before when I started this live stream that. Trees are a four-season resource. 
for medicinals. And the reason I say that Okay, that's a helicopter. I heard an engine out there. It sounded like somebody's riding a quad across my backyard. But, okay, back to what I was saying. Uh, plant medicinals is more of a two to three season. Trees, you can go out there any season, especially if, if you're using the uh, ingredients dry. You can get them and do what you need to do. Okay, we're going to go in the white ash. Now, the ash up here, in the vast scheme of things, was recently wiped out with with the emerald ash borer. And uh, we don't, I think my dad said walk around, not on our property, he was over on the other property. He said he found a couple of young ash trees starting to come back up. But um, that emerald ash borer really did in our ash trees around here. And when that first started, we found out that we did have some ash borers, like from the get-go. So what we did on our property anyway, right. and I think a couple of the other properties that are that surround us, is that we sold our ash off. I'm like, instead of having all this dead ash trees, just clog, uh, clogging up everything. I never heard that before. I, heard, I knew about the zigzag, but I didn't know about the flat rock. Interesting. That is very interesting. Okay, ash is a very hard wood without much flexibility. It has a fine straight grain. Seasoned, it was made into rolling pins and handles, handles for tools such as hoes and shovels that didn't require a lot of spring. I mean, that's... Hey, what's up, Tennessee? So, ash was used for stuff that you didn't really want flexibility, or you didn't need flexibility. But, um, yeah. What about that? Okay. Uh, and, and, and in the rolling pins, um, ash is a very hard wood. They used to make baseball bats out of ash. <laughs> Actually, any knowledge is good knowledge. As useless as I, it may seem at the time, any knowledge is good knowledge. Okay. Black gum. Black gum, bleh, black gum trees grow quite large. And the older, older ones are often hollow inside. For this reason, it's about the only tree that can be used for bee gums. Toothbrushes were made from its twigs. That's when I have to look look up bee. Oh, I know. Beehives. They used to use the uh, black gum trees for beehives. I have seen that before. Slices of the of the trunk, five or six inches thick, could be used for solid wagon wheels. A hole would be built board in the center for the axle. And the unusual crosswise, crosswise grain would keep them from cracking and splitting apart, which is another good thing, especially when you have a um, a wagon wheel, something that's constantly in contact with the ground and it's holding up weight. And those would be the ones that didn't haul themselves out yet. Uh, we had a couple black gum trees back here, but every tree they mentioned in, mentioned in here, we we ha either have or had at one point in time. I do believe we have a couple more black gum trees back there. Now, they didn't get into birch, um, um, ironwood, and some, some of the other ones. But the ones that they got into, I had, we had here or have here. 
and uh, talk about the beehives, what they call bee gums. Um, there's a couple places, not on our property, but on public land, and uh, game lands. I remember walking around, and the black gum tree was probably about a good three foot around, was hollow, and had a beehive in there. Yeah, see that we did have one Osage orange tree. Supposedly there's another one back there because I still find the oranges, but I can't find where the trees at. Um, I, would, I think it's up on the hill. We have a steep hill there, and it looks like they kind of hit and rolled down. But I've been all over that hill up there. <laughs> oh, there you go. Because that's one thing I've always wanted to try to do is split my own Ocean George and make a recurve bow or a straight bow, one of the two. Okay, we're going to finish up the chapter here with other woods. Other varieties have few uses, but they were often distinguished for at least one important function. Black birch, for example, was used for was used was used season for fiddles and guitars because of its curly grain. Sassafras was sometimes used for wheel hubs and ox yokes. Sourwood made made fine canes and sled runners. Dogwood is so hard that when cured, it was perfect for glutes and shuttles. Moth resistant moth resistant chests were fashioned out of cedar. And for all these woods, there are, doubt, there are doubtless uses that, that we have not come across yet. The important thing, of course, is that each had its own distinctive characteristics and few mountain men were ever without a working knowledge of these characteristics and, and how, how to best use them. Their, their survival too often depended on it. Yeah, see, I know people who, yeah, the roasted sassafras. Now, did you use pink or did you use a white wood? Because I remember my grandfather, when we used to have plentiful sassafras trees back here, which they seem to die off for some reason. Uh, they're coming back slowly. But when we had when we had plentiful plentiful sassafras, he would use the pink roots and make grind them up to make a sassafras tea. So I mean, there, there's another another use for sassafras for you. Um, one thing I used to do is I. Used to when I find a sassafras tree, I used to pull off a leaf and stick it in my mouth. They, they, we also had tea berry. Okay, I think that's why I was looking for the pink ones, because pink ones, I think, were either the wood or lower in that content. Because you said you don't use white, white will make you sick. But you use pink, you'll be just fine. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think, we um, we have beach on the property too. Yes, it is. Now the one thing I don't know if they still sell it. I used to get the tea berry tea, and not tea gum. Uh, they used to, I think I don't know if there's Wrigley's. It's the same people who made blackjack. They made uh, tea berry gum. And that stuff was good. Yep. Uh, 
Um, we have beech trees here, and I'm trying to remember. I I'm trying to remember beech trees. I think one of them, yeah, it's beech. It's a beech or it's a birch. One of them I know, like the birch tree, especially white birch, you can take the uh, bark off of it, like the out, outer bark, because it comes off almost like paper. That's that white birch, that, that bark comes off like paper. You work it up because that outside bark is already dry. You could you process it, kind of get it fine. What, what I mean by processing it and getting it fine is you increase the surface area by kind of making smaller pieces. It gives that spark a better a better chance of getting started. And I think the beach, we used to cut squares off of it, and you can light it with a lighter. There's a, a chemical in a beech tree that would take a flame and it would burn it would only burn for like maybe two or three no about three or four minutes but that's a three or four minute working time you had to get a fire started okay um and with the pine trees uh, talking about medicinals, uh, they used to use pine sap because most pine saps are antiseptic in nature. Um, I had a um, a friend of mine had pine sap. I cut myself. We put some of that pine sap on it, and I'll be honest with you. I mean. Usually it was me, if I get a cut and I stay working like I did did after I got that particular cut. Yes, they do. Yes, Emma. And that's what makes that's what's in the fat wood that makes it so flammable is that turpentine. But that pine salve with it being antiseptic in nature also has has uh, some healing pro right. other healing pro properties in it as well. That's interesting. I never heard about that. But um, after two days, I mean, I never got a scab. After two days, the cut was sealed. No scab. And like, like a Yep. Oh, it's a good possibility. Um, there's a book here that I really want to dig into, and it kind of starts going into like the some of the medical uses and some the medicinal uses of some of these trees, which I find very interesting because as I said a tree is a four season resource. Um, they're not going anywhere as the plants will grow, then they'll die, then they'll grow, then they'll die. So you only have two to three, three seasons to gather those. Three if you're lucky, two if you're good. And usually out of those two, it's only like two to one to three month window to get them when they're at their best. Um. Trying to think, there's one other thing I was going to talk about. Oh, like I have ironwood here on the property. Now, ironwood is literally harder than locust. That's why I call it ironwood. Um, I know somebody that was trying to cut a. Oh, awesome, Tennessee. Okay. That's interesting. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left here before Go goes live. So, what I'm going to do here, if anybody wants to come up, I'm going to go ahead and slot the link in here.
So if everyone wants to come up and talk about this, uh, feel free. And um, another thing I found out is um, a lot of your woody bushes, like I have, we have dogwood. Now the dogwood that we have around here, though, it's only gets about yo big around. It is extremely, extremely hard. I've seen a lot of people taking dead dogwood and making walking sticks out of it. Um, their grandparents, their great grandparents, made walking sticks that they're still using today, and it still looks like the day that they made the walking stick from that dead piece of dogwood. Uh, for some reason, our dogwoods don't get. They don't get big to begin with, but I think the biggest dogwood that we had back there, and they only get so big and they die off because dogwoods seem to be a tree or bush, bush tree, depending on how it grows, that needs a lot of sunlight. And these things are growing in what used to be a pasture, but has uh, a lot of oak, maple, hickory cherry trees are towering above it so once the canopy fills in they're not getting any light yep uh we have on our on the property here i found one ironwood tree about that big around and it has a bunch of shoots coming out underneath of it so what I'm trying to do is I'm actually trying to keep that protected uh, until I can figure out if I can move those shoots around a little bit or if they're all coming up. If they're coming off of one stem, I'm going to leave them, I mean, one root system, I'm going to leave them alone. But they kind of have their own little root systems. I'm going to see if I can try to move them around. And if I can't, I want to keep that one protected. It's like for some resources, especially on, on a woodlot, if you only have one, it's one of those one of those things that you don't want to just use it up. You want to keep it for as long as you can until you can propagate more. Yeah, because these ones, the ones that we have, I think there's only one or two left. There was a point in time in our understory, just on the back side of our property, going into the next property, just the white dogwood flowers as far as the eye could see for about, I would say as far as I could see, but it was a 100 yard by 100 yard area. So it was like a, a thousand square yards, literally. literally. Or I would I won't, I won't go that far. I just, we had a almost like an acre of nothing but dogwood understory beneath the canopy, and as I said, for some reason these things just died off. I think we only have like two two left that actually attempt to flower now. Um, that's why I was thinking maybe these things need more sunlight, but. Um, the other thing we have back here is vines. We have more vines. There are some areas, and I'd like to do a video on it once it, either, once it warms up and dries up a little bit because it's still ankle deep out there. But uh, there's a couple areas behind my house talking about trees that the vines have tore the trees down. Now, our biggest ones up here are strangler vines. And grapevines. No, see, we don't have any persimmon around here at all. Or pawpaw. Pawpaw, you can get pawpaw in Ohio, like southern um, southern Ohio. I should say southeast Ohio, but you can't find them around here unless somebody planted them. Yeah, and the ones that I have back there, which are naturally occurring, 
never got that big. I think the biggest dogwood tree is maybe about that big around and maybe about 12 feet tall. I don't know. I think it, it also has a lot to do with the soil it's growing in, the conditions it's growing in, what have you. Um, but get back to what I was saying with the vines, if uh, you let the vines go unchecked on in your woods, uh, eventually, especially if they start growing on a tree, I, I literally watched them tear the top out of an oak tree, and that oak tree was about two foot around. I'm sit, I was walking through the woods, I heard a crack, I looked over and dressed it. Probably. That's what I'm thinking, Tibor. I heard a crack. And the oak tree is probably one of the tallest trees that's in the wood at, woods at the time. And the cherry, and the cherry, the grapevines was actually grew up into the canopy of that tree, up into the top of that tree. I heard a crack, and I just seen the, literally seen the vines pull the, pull the top of the tree right out. And the reason I say it pulled the top of the tree out is the weight of that of those grapevines got so much that the tree couldn't handle it anymore. And the tree was still alive. That's what really boggled my mind. But after it after I heard it hit the ground, I walked up to it. And it was just a big knot of grapevines and red oak. That's what it was. That I don't know about. I do know that we'll, in some areas, we do have some kudzu, but it doesn't really take hold up here for some reason, which is a good thing, I guess. Oh, I, I hear you, Tennessee. I mean, it's, up here, I think we're kind of up here in Pennsylvania. I think we're kind of blessed with that because it, it, they kind of seem to pop up in one area, but leave it, leave everything else alone. They don't just kind of just go willy nilly all over the place. Like I know down in Georgia, um, a couple of people I know down in Georgia, they have a big problem with uh, wisteria. And one of the people that I know that has a problem with wisteria, they're they are the ones who planted it. It's just it's just so beautiful when you growing up the side of the house. I'm like, you get that stuff up off your house or it'll pull the whole damn wall down. But um one thing I do know about kudzu, and you may laugh when I say this, deer like kudzu. Yeah, see, we don't have any of that Japanese honeysuckle either. And I said, I think that's like from like Tennessee on down or like Virginia on down that you start running into that. But up here, okay. Um, watch Sidestep Adventures. He's restoring a hundred and forty-four year old. Um, homestead. They actually brought a tractor in to get rid of all the wisteria because it, the whole property was taken over with it. Well, there you go. If you want to get rid of your country, get a goat. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's what I've seen in, in that kudzu. 
from what I hear, it almost grows like corn. If you stand outside during a quiet night, you can hear it grow. Same thing with North American bamboo, which we have a whole problem with it right over there. Hey, Capone, how you doing? Great, thanks. To learn how I can help, ask, what can you do? My Cortana just popped up. Just, <laughs> that's the voice you hear. But, um, yeah, like, I, during the night with that um, North American bamboo, I've been out there on a quiet night. And it would be in full swing. And you could literally hear it grow. Literally hear it grow. And it's like, what the hell? <laughs> uh, it's, it's almost as bad as corn. Corn is another one. When it starts growing and starts growing fast, you could actually hear corn grow too. I know a lot of people, I've never heard it. You never paid attention. Go out by yourself, be nice and quiet. When it when the corn's in full swing, and you'll hear it make little, I was like little cracking or popping noises as it grows. But uh, with the whole tree thing, though, is one of the things I definitely want to do is, especially in some of the areas that I want to possibly use some or cut some um we're gonna go to a little journey right around the woods right right behind my house here on on the woodlot part of the house which is five and a half acres and we're gonna start identifying trees um i like i, I want to get a good handle of what's out there um areas that i might want to thin out what I mean by thinning them out is I don't think I'm going to completely thin them out, but I'm going to thin them out enough that I'm going to make some trails through it. These, I would say decent-sized trails, but an easier way to get through it. And it's good for wattle fence, but not good with... It's, 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 an, it's invasive. And the only thing that we found that kills that North American bamboo, if you're ready to laugh, is we threw some old pumpkins down into it where the pumpkins came up and killed the bamboo because it took all the food away from it. So volunteer pumpkins will kill North American bamboo because we, we hit it with gasoline, um, Roundup, um, tried cutting it back every chance we could. And it seemed like the more we tried to kill it, the faster it grew. We threw the pumpkins in there and said, hell with it, we'll just keep it trimmed out of the yard and not that anyway. We threw the pumpkins in there and there's like big holes like this where those volunteer pumpkins came up that there's, <laughs> so like, we need to throw more pumpkins down there. <laughs> I just I just found that rather interesting, but it is good for that. Um, the bamboo is, is good for wattle fencing. The other thing that is good for is making tenkara poles. Uh, what tenkara is, and it's a Japanese form of fishing. It's kind of like fly fishing, but you don't have a reel. You actually tie the line on the very end. <laughs> of a 12 to 15 foot long piece of Ameri of North American bamboo. And you sw swing the bait out and drop it in the water. Nothing, nothing hits it there, you pick it up, you swing it out, and you drop it in someplace else. But your, your string length is gonna come down to the very base of your handle where you're working it at. So you, you can get it out 30 feet. What, in whatever direction. Yeah, kind of like a fly rod. Now, the interesting thing is, is I've seen somebody take one of them, a, a North American bamboo um, plants, 
or shoots or whatever you want to call it. Cut it to about eight foot long. They had little, they had um, little eyelets that they bought. They duct, they, yeah, they duct taped them onto it, and they actually, and they put, they actually uh, zip tied a reel onto it, and they made a fishing rod out of it, and they were catching fish with it. Yeah, that's what I heard about the Japanese honeysuckle. That, you know, animals don't even want nothing to do with it. Yeah, but I think the original flywood fly rods are actually made out of actual bamboo. North American bamboo isn't exactly bamboo. It's just a very tall invasive plant that's a pain in the yeah. Hey, Tennessee, and talking about doing the uh, European hedge builders, something, something to try. Instead of using Chinese uh, privet, use multiple rows, wild rows, and try to get that into a hedge. If Because if you're doing the... Uh, the if you're doing a European hedge boater thing, if you're doing that for security, that'd be one of the best things because not only does it get thick, it has thorns on it like cat's claws. And it's worse than barbed wire. I know from experience. <laughs> But um, we're actually just a little bit past the one hour mark, so I think I'm going to go ahead and. Yeah, see, a lot of people call River Cane too, but we're, in, we're not no, nowhere close to River. And, well, I kind of like North American bamboo. It's the same thing, so. Oh, I got gotcha. you. You have it on hand, and it grows quick. Actually, hey, I say go for it. Okay, and I'm going to be, I'm done anyway, Capone. So I thank you all for coming. You all have a great night. And in, I'm saying about two weeks. We're going to pick back up on that book. Uh, next week, I'm not exactly sure which, which direction I'm going to head, but as I said, I'm going to keep it in every other week, so I'm going to just keep beating uh, the same thing over and over again. But you guys have a great night. I love you all, and I'll probably see most of you over at Gills. So talk to you all later. Night, all.